I am going to get this thing started. If I can get a thumbs up from Dr. Guy and Dr. Berta, we're ready to go. Thumbs up. All right. So welcome everyone to our second session of our DOD STEM Opportunities webinar, specifically designed for our AEOP apprentices and mentors. Um, we're glad that you're all here. On the call today, we have apprentices from across the country. Um, the apprentices who are in high school are in our REAP, HSAP, and CAP programs. Um, REAP and HSAP programs are based at universities, and CAP is based at Army facilities. We also have some undergraduates joining us today, and welcome to you. Um, our URAP program is, um, again, based at universities and actually co-located with HSAP. So we have high school students and undergraduate students working side by side in labs. And then our College Qualified Leaders Program, CQL, is also based at Army facilities. So welcome everyone today, and also welcome our speakers, um, Dr. Catherine Guy and Dr. Eric Berta. If you weren't part of last week's seminar, um, just wanted to give you a little overview of what these webinars are all about. This is um, our apprentices' time to really meet and speak with scientists and engineers who are across the country doing some really interesting work. So we picked people who um, have a variety of expertise and have worked in different fields. Today, chemistry rules the day, as both um, Dr. Guy and Dr. Berta have a background in chemistry, and they'll explain all that means and how they put chemistry to work in different engineering scenarios. Um, so we want you to get an idea of what's going on. Um, this, what our speakers talk about today may be different than what you're studying in your apprenticeship program. So this gives you a chance to um, explore different fields, um, maybe get excited about something new or different. We also want you to learn how scientists and engineers get to where they are today and how, um, how they do their work. So please ask questions and um, use this time um, as your time because that's really why we're all here. And with that, I am going to give it over to Dr. Eric Berta from the University of New Hampshire. Um, he's going to explain his background, so I won't spend much time introducing him or Dr. Guy, but I will let Dr. Berta take, take control. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, audio is fine. You guys can hear me? It's great. Outstanding. Uh, so uh, thanks for the invitation, and uh, thanks, everyone, for... Um, you know, signing on and uh, listening to a little bit about uh, my background. So, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of New Hampshire. I'm uh, in the chemistry department and also in the material science program. And uh, so my background is, uh, I, you know, I was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, grew up in the Philadelphia area, uh, suburb of Philadelphia called Narstown. And then I did my bachelor's degree in chemistry at Penn State, uh, graduated in 2003. And then from there, I went to the University of Florida for my PhD, uh, did my PhD in organic chemistry and polymer chemistry uh, under Ken Wagner, kind of a, a legendary polymer scientist. And then after grad school, I moved to Europe, to the Netherlands, a uh, small town about an hour southeast of Amsterdam uh, called Eindhoven. And uh, there's a really good technical university there and probably the, the best lab in the world in supermolecular chemistry. So I learned supermolecular chemistry there and in 2010 uh, moved to UNH and I've been here ever since. So uh, this picture here is an a image of a UNH campus on uh, probably the nicest day of the year. Usually it's completely covered in snow, uh, you know, from December until May. Uh, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful place. Uh, Beautiful New England campus where 12,000 undergrads, about four or 5,000 grad students, 600 faculty, uh, really great place to work and learn. And uh, if y'all are interested in uh, studying chemistry and polymer science in particular, um, you know, get, get in touch with me and uh, let's talk. So go ahead to the next slide. It's just taking a second for the mouse to work here. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> All right, so what do I do? Um, it says on the top here, I can't believe this is a real thing. So I, I pulled this slide from a talk I gave um, 
last week or two weeks ago um, with uh, a bunch of professors I know really well, so I was, I was kind of making the joke. But uh, if you look at the images on this slide, you might think that I was a biologist because this stuff looks like biology. But here's the thing. Biology is just chemistry in practice. At some point, chemistry became biology. And so if you kind of extend that thinking, if we understand these basic principles, we should be able to use chemistry to make biology, or at least use chemistry to make things that are like biology. And so one of the things that biology does really well is a uh, very specific uh, synthesis of very well-defined materials. Uh, right in the center of this screen is a picture. It says uh, something about uh, you know, www.x. P-A-S-Y under it. This is a ribbon structure of um, a polymerase enzyme. So this enzyme is really good at catalyzing a very specific reaction. And it does that based on the, the geometry of this molecule and its shape and, and how it interacts with things around it. Uh, to the bottom of that, you see this really complex assembly of, uh, you know, it's a cartoon, but the, the cell membrane with membrane proteins embedded in it and all of these little proteins work together to make up the flagella motor of a bacteria. So this is a way that biology uses chemistry to uh, store energy and create work and then turn that energy into a physical movement. So a nano-sized machine that's based on, on just simple, simple chemistry. Uh, to the very left, you see a picture of uh, uh, the ribosome. I forget exactly where this graphic came from, but ribosome is a, a, a little nano-sized ball of, of polymer that can read the information written in one polymer and then translate that information to synthesize a material that, that is useful for something. So lots of levels of uh, hierarchy involved in um, you know, bringing this complex function uh, to fruition. And again, it's all based on the principles of chemistry. This little guy in the bottom is a picture of a virus. And so I'm gonna use the virus as an example of uh, you know, how we think about trying to use what biology has taught us to engineer new materials. So if you go to the next slide, let's dig back on the virus and figure out how this thing works, okay? So if you look at the left, you got the picture of the virus. This virus is a cage, and the cage is made of 36 copies of this star-shaped assembly. That's right next to that. So you see, see there, it says pentamer of dimers. So this star shape assembly, if we pull that apart into its five single uh, constituents, it's, it's uh, an assembly of two polymer chains uh, linked together in a very specific way. If we were to separate those two chains out, you get that uh, well-defined single molecule uh, nano assembly that's kind of at the, at the bottom right. And if we were to grab the one end and the other end of that and just kind of pull on this and stretch it out, we'd get this long single polymer chain which is made up of uh, very specific arrangements of amino acids all, all lined up in a row, all right? So from a chemist's perspective, we know how to do that. We know how to make things. We know how to make molecules. We can go into the laboratory and do that. Uh, but unfortunately, we'll never be able to do exactly what nature does because this backward sequence where we go from the, the polymer chain you see down in the, the, the bottom left all the way back through the virus particle in the, in the top left uh, the chemistry to make a polymer chain that precise doesn't exist yet. So what we do in my lab is kind of think of a, a simplistic and rudimentary way to sort of try and copy this. Go ahead to the next slide. So if what nature is doing is the top thing here, you make this chain where every single polymer chain is exactly the same size, every single polymer chain has exactly the same uh, sequence of amino acids, Short sections of those uh, sequences result in local folding. The entire structure itself results in this sort of global folding. You get this really well-defined nano-sized object that has a function based on its shape. We can't do that. But what we can do is sort of mimic this by making a, a simpler molecule. So that's what you see uh, just under the uh, kind of multicolored bead thing is this uh, gray chain. There you go, exactly, uh, with these blue bits on it. So what we'll do in my lab is we'll make this sort of vanilla flavored gray polymer chain that's completely unfunctionalized. And then along the background, we sprinkle it with some functional groups that we know can undergo an organic transformation. 
and then we'll dilute this thing in solution down to the point where it's just kind of floating around by itself and it doesn't see any of the other polymer chains. And then we trigger that organic reaction. So the blue bits all find each other and this whole thing kind of collapses on itself and makes a nano sized uh, single molecule network. So if we go forward one click, to beat this analogy to death, if, imagine a single polymer chain is a piece of paper. Go ahead, click again. Nature's doing some ridiculous level of origami that I can't even believe is real. What we're doing is sort of making a rudimentary mimic of this, a three-dimensional object out of a one-dimensional chain. And so the overall goal of the research is what chemistry can we do to do this? Uh, what are the limitations? What are the design parameters that we have to do as polymer chemists to affect this process? And then finally, what kind of functional nanomaterial can we make? And then can we use sort of the same principles we get from nature to then engineer materials um, that have a function that uh, would be useful for um, a medicinal application or a defense application? Kind of think of both of those things simultaneously. So that's the quick and dirty overview, kind of 30,000 foot look at the research we do in my lab. And uh, you know, that's, that's my intro. That's what I got for you. Great, great. So this is a chance for people to submit their questions into the chat box. Um, and while they do that, how about I ask, what, what greater good does nanotechnology serve? So how, how would you use this? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think, you know, the, the overall idea of nanotechnology to, to me is, is kind of a buzzy, a buzzy word or a buzzword. Uh, you know, chemists have always been nanotechnologists because chemistry is below the nanoscale. So any, anytime you're, you're making chemistry and doing chemistry, you're doing nanotechnology. Lots of molecules to organize together sort of, sort of access that nano size scale. And that's the scale where biology operates. So the reason we do this kind of thing is, is twofold. If you want to interact with biology, you need to work at the same sky, size scale that biology is working on. And so you know, proteins, enzymes, these kind of things, the, the machinery of the cells uh, are, are nanotechnology. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, again, if biology is doing this, if you think of the way that plants operate, right, a plant can take CO2 and water and oxygen out of the air and turn it into a sugar and then turn that sugar into cellulose, which is a really fantastic material, right? Imagine if we could make a, you know, a nano-sized polymer object that could also catalyze a polymerization reaction using those kind of things and made, I don't know, a, a, you know a, a vest out of it. Then if your vest gets damaged, it can polymerize just like nature does with molecules in the air and heal itself, right? So, so thinking about making advanced materials that have the kind of capabilities that a biological system would have, um, you know, is, it, it's, it's kind of like sci-fi at this point, but in 10, 20, 40, 50 years from now, um, you'll see the kind of things uh, laboratories like our lab and other labs across the world um, are developing now will we'll have those kind of applications. Great. And so we have our first question from a student. Grace wonders, how many years did you have to study after high school to reach where you are now? Uh, what I usually tell people is it was like a bonus. I studied one year less after high school than I did from first grade through 12th grade. So it took <laughs> me 11 years from the time I graduated high school to get my first academic job. Basically, five years in college, five years in grad school, two years as a postdoc, right. um, you know, in and around there. It was about the same amount of time. Right. Can you explain what a postdoc is for folks who so may not know? So a postdoc is basically uh, uh, a position that you take after you finish your PhD, where you go into a laboratory, usually an academic lab, but there's also industrial postdocs and um, uh, government postdocs as well. And so basically it's the equivalent of like a residency for a doctor, okay? You're already, you're already a, a PhD, you're already a doctor, you know, you know your science in and out. It's an opportunity for you to go and then specialize in another area and um, really, kind of, really kind of show your stuff. Um, you start managing uh, your own research, you, you kind of do the things uh, uh, in a slightly more supervised way than you would completely independently, um, but it's still, uh, you know, more, um, a little bit more education than, than just jumping right into the job. Right. And last week, um, Dr. 
um, Matthew Munson had mentioned how the SMART program had paid for his graduate school. Um, did you have fellowships for your graduate school that paid for your, um, for your tuition and maybe a stipend? Yep, so usually in, in physical sciences and engineering, when you go for a PhD, um, <clears throat> you're supported by the department uh, in some way. So um, often your first year or two, you'll be a teaching assistant for a laboratory class or something like that. That pays your bills, and then you also do your research and coursework on the side. It covers your tuition. Um, you know, my, my students will say they're indentured servants. It's not exactly what, what it is. Uh, it's an assistantship. But, um, and then from there, once you're a little more advanced, um, your research advisor typically will have federal funding of some sort, and they'll support you through that federal funding. So your, your degree is basically paid for by the taxpayers uh, with the idea that the research you're doing is, is doing some good for, uh, for humanity. Right. And I know that Dr. Guy is going to tell us about how she funded her PhD too, which is a little different as well. Um, so we have a question from Isabella. Um, what type of research did you do while you were in Europe? So the research I did in Europe was, uh, you know, sort of the prototype for the work I do in my laboratory. I, I went to this guy, uh, uh, Professor Meyer, and Professor Meyer has this, you know, super overarching, you know, concept where you know, he says, what if we could just mix up a bunch of chemicals in a bucket and have a cell pop out? What would we need to figure out in order to, to make that happen? Um, you know, and, and as being an organic chemist and somebody interested in polymers for a long time, uh, you know, we started talking about, well, we should try to mimic the protein first. And that's where the whole sort of uh, concept of single chain nanoparticles uh, came from. So uh, in his lab, we worked on doing this where the cross-linking unit was uh, hydrogen bonding, just like you see in nature. So a, a metastable supermolecular interaction. But, um, you know, day to day, it was, a, it was a lot of organic chemistry in a lot of senses. Right. That's great. Uh, having taken organic chemistry once in my life, I'm trying to keep up with you. So... <laughs> um, can you explain um, how your research benefits the Army? Because a lot of people on this call are working on Army grants or at Army facilities. So how are you involved with Army research? So the thing I love the most about the polymer program um, at the Army uh, that Dr. Poré is the, uh, the program manager, uh, they're interested in really high risk uh, and potentially high payout research where um, they look at a lot of the kind of things that I, that I explained earlier. So they're interested in um, really well-defined polymers, polymers with sequence definition, polymers that undergo uh, a well-defined assembly into nanoscale uh, objects. And these kind of things at a basic level are areas of science that we don't really have a great grasp on yet. Um, and so by investing in laboratories that work on this stuff, um, and, and lots of different laboratories that do different pieces of this, we're kind of going to build sort of a library of techniques and a library of understanding that in 50 years will be sort of the next generation of, of defense capabilities. Um, so, you know, at the very surface, it may, it may seem like it's a stretch. Why is this mission uh, specific? Why is this going to help a soldier tomorrow? It's not going to help the soldier tomorrow. It's going to make sure that, uh, that our defense capabilities outstrip everybody else, uh, you know, well down the line. That's the idea. Right. And of course, this has applications to everyday life, too. There may be something that we are wearing or using in 20 years that has links back to this research, right? Absolutely. I mean, the internet came out of defense research. We wouldn't right. be having this conversation right now if, <laughs> if we weren't supporting basic science. So Exactly, exactly. Um, maybe explain what basic science is for those who may not understand that concept. Well, that's a, I've been trying to explain this to myself <laughs> for a long time. So I would say, you know, applied science has a very defined goal, okay? If you, if you need to make a, a material that has a certain hardness, a certain resistiveness to, that's even a word, to, uh, you know, solvent or heat or light or something like that. If you want to make a car tire better, you know exactly what the goal is. You know exactly what parameters you need in order to do that. Basic science is the kind of things that you discover um, that gives you the tools to then make those changes to applied science. So maybe you know you need a material with a certain property. You don't exactly know how to get there. 
So basic science has this question, okay, what are the fundamental properties? What do we need to understand about the, the way chemistry works, the way physics works, the way biology works? If we can understand those underlying principles, then we have sort of a tool set to then use that to tackle applied problems. So those are, those are kind of the, the two sides of it. And then the more applied you get, I guess the more towards engineering you go. Great. And we have another question. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce the person's first name. I'm sorry. Um, what's one project or breakthrough in your area of study that, you, that you're really excited about? And thanks for being fine with me not trying to pronounce your name. Um, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, as, as I pointed out, uh, if you look, if you look the slide that's up, so the little blue thing that points to the crumpled up piece of paper. Here's an issue, okay? When we do the little blue thing to get to the crumpled up piece of paper, we have to do this in dilute solution. When I say dilute solution, I mean one milligram of material in a milliliter of solvent. So to put that up to scale, if I want to make a gram of material, I need to use a whole liter of solvent. If I need to make a ton of material, to use it for something, then the amount of solvent I need, we're talking about like a, like a lake. And, and that's ridiculous. You're never gonna be able to do that. So a recent breakthrough in our lab, we figured out how to do this without relying on that ultra high dilution. So we figured out a technique where we can, uh, where we can do this and uh, basically we make the crumpled up piece of paper and once that's made, we can just continuously uh, make more and more of this without having them all stick together. So a way to, a way to scale this process up and actually make a usable amount of material. Um, so we, yeah, we published that paper maybe a year ago and uh, we're still sort of fine tuning that. But I think that was, uh, that was the most important contribution uh, thus far. I think that's, that's the one I'm most excited about. Mm -hmm. Great, great. We'll just give another second. Um, I may ask this question of Dr. Guy too, and that is that organic chemistry can be really hard for people um, who may not have chemistry as their, um, as their major or field of interest, yet it's something that's really important to get through. Um, I still have flashbacks of my flashcards <laughs> of all the different, um, all the different reactions that I had to memorize. So what advice would you give to students who are either chemistry students trying to get through their first hard, really hard course or those who are studying different fields and need to take chemistry? I think the, the, the thing about organic chemistry is, is the, principle, the principles at work aren't really difficult. It's just that you're, you're forced to learn a second language while you're learning these these principles at the same time and so uh look at it in in two ways look at it that you have to learn this sort of archaic uh, written language where everything's in lines and letters and hexagons and then separate that from the underlying principles uh and make it about those principles and not about memorization and the easiest way i can i can tell you is uh there's always something that has some kind of positive character, something that always has some kind of negative character, and those things always want to interact with each other. So if you understand what the language is telling you, you can always find those sites of like minus or electron density and, and plus or areas that the electrons want to be and figure out the way that they're going to interact. Um, you know, it's a little easier said, said than done. I've had, you know, almost 20 years of experience working on this now, but that's, uh, I think that's the way to approach it. Work on it, just like you work on a language, work on it every single day. Don't study, you know, two hours before your exam. Study two hours every single day and mm -hmm. you'll pick it up. Right, right. That's great advice. And I see Dr. Guy smiling too. So it seems like we're through our questions, but I would say, Dr. Berta, hang out because we may have someone with questions for you at the end too. And maybe Dr. Guy can ask you some questions as well. Um, so why don't we switch over the presentation to, and the little animation is coming for everybody to see. Um, so Dr. Catherine Guy um, is working in Illinois. She is a chemist with the U.S. Army 
um, Erdek Searle, and she'll explain what that is, but it's Construction Engineering Research Lab, and she's going to explain some of her work as well. Dr. Okay. Guy, take it away. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. You sound great. Okay. So I guess, um, as mentioned, I now work at Erdek Searle in Champaign, Illinois, but I, you know, definitely took a course to get here. I grew up in North Carolina. I was born and raised there. And then I went to College of William & Mary in Virginia for undergrad. I was really looking for a school where I could do hands-on work. And William & Mary has a great uh, bachelor level. Like, you come in as freshman and you actually get into a research lab. Um, so if you are looking for hands-on stuff, it's great to, you know, look for that in your university, as well as the courses they offer. I uh, graduated from William Mary with a chemistry degree with an uh, inorganic polymer focus and a double major with math. From there, I ended up at University of Illinois here in Champaign, Illinois uh, for, to do a PhD in chemistry. I was working there on catalysis and looking for ways to treat, treat drinking water to remove some of the contaminants. Um, when I was in grad school, my goals were to leave Illinois upon graduation and not work for the government. Well, I didn't even leave the city. I am still in Champaign, Illinois, and I am now working for the Army. But it's turned out well. I've now been in Erdic for eight years. Um, below the Erdic logo, you notice I have materials engineer there. It's sort of a running joke I have with a bunch of my coworkers because that's my technical title. Until I got here at Erdic, I had never taken an engineering course in my life. So the fact that I was all of a sudden an engineer was interesting to me. Uh, I have since gone on and actually Erdic has paid for me to go and get an environmental engineering certificate. So I completed that in the fall. So now I guess I technically am an engineer, sort of. <laughs> the next slide, please. Sure. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Um, so what do I do? Uh, it really is pretty much whatever I can get someone to give me money for. Uh, it's, there's not much constraint. You have to be, I guess, within your mission statement. Um, you have to at least make a case for it being there. So I've done things like going out to various army installations, teach them how to do any energy audits, uh, show them how to assess their lighting. Is it too high, too low? Can they change their bulbs? Will it save them energy? Will they, you know, all the projects cost money to do, but can they get that back in a reasonable amount of time through energy savings? Um, I've also worked a lot with paint coatings here at Erdic Searle. We have a paint technology center that is uh, tests all the paints that are used on core projects. So anytime the Army Corps, you know, paints a bridge or a dam, the uh, paint gets tested here. We've also done energy saving coatings. Uh, the little huts there in the middle are looking at various paints that have materials in them that claim to save energy and help insulate the buildings. We pretty quickly came up with paint your building white if you want to stay cool, uh, black if you want to stay warm. <laughs> it doesn't matter what's in the paint, it's the color that matters. Uh, we've moved on knowing that into, can we put a thermochrome into the paint to get energy savings in both summer and winter? So this thermochrome will change colors at a set point. We're looking at about 60, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the summer, it would be in its light phase either clear or white, and in the winter it would be switching over to black. This would result in a paint that goes from probably a light, or probably from white to light gray, medium gray, or we could put in a colored paint and have a light green to a dark green transition. Um, we're still working on this one. Right now it's not at all stable outside, so we're trying to find ways to protect it from solar radiation. Okay. And then I guess the third big project that I've done since coming here is work on wastewater treatment and reuse. Water reuse is becoming more and more critical, especially in remote areas. And finding ways that can treat it without requiring a large energy in input is also important. A lot of these remote areas are trucking in both fuel and water. So you don't want to you know, save water by using more fuel because then you don't gain any benefit, really. So we're looking at a treatment system that uses microbes on the front end to break down a lot of the organic carbon matter. And then on the tail end, we have a process that captures ammonia and converts it into hydrogen gas. 
So we actually generate both methane and hydrogen fuels in this project. So it treats wastewater and fuels. So hopefully, hopefully it's a benefit. Um, we're going to put it out in the field here in the next coming year and see if we can actually run it remotely. And as the bottom right corner says, you know, always looking for the next big thing, whatever, you know, sounds fun, sounds interesting, and you get somebody to pay for. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? Mm -hmm. So next slide. Uh, one of the benefits of working for the government is there are a lot of installations throughout the U.S. I've done quite a bit of traveling in the eight years I've been here. Uh, some of these are also conference sites uh, down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. That's the headquarter of ERDIC. So a lot of our sister labs are down there. Um, I hope to add more stars to this graph as time goes on, but got to see a lot of the country this way. Mm -hmm. Great. So in addition to my work, you know, on the various projects, I also am really involved in the outreach opportunities through AEOP and through Erdic Searle, um, their support for these projects or programs. So I've past, I guess, seven or eight summers now, I've worked with GEMS, uh, mostly the middle school group, helping to run the program and get the middle school students interested in science and get myself interested in science again, remind myself why I got into the field in the first place. Um, this summer we were playing with glow sticks and thermochromic slime and Lego Mindstorms, so it's a chance to have fun with science. And then I also have mentored several CF students now uh, in the high school program. And it's always great to, to see the world and see the projects through fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. And this summer I actually have a high school intern, or not a high school, high school teacher, who's interning with me. Nice. Uh, he's here for four weeks under the reset program. I guess, I think that's it. So, any questions? Questions. So how about a first question? Um, maybe we should have defined this at the beginning. What does Erdic Searle stand for? Ah. Erdic Searle is Engineer Research Development Center, and that's it's a conglomeration of six or seven labs. And they're located, the headquarters are located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And Searle is the Construction Engineering Research Lab, and it's one of the satellite labs up in Champaign, Illinois. Great. Great. So here's a question. Um, we know that a lot of people who are based at universities publish. Um, and as someone at an army facility, Laurel asks, um, do you publish any of your work or findings? Yes. Uh, it's not as, I guess I say, as common in the academic world. Uh, we do publish in scientific journals a lot. And going to the question earlier about basic versus applied science, if you have basic science projects, you tend to publish a lot more in academic journals. Mm -hmm. As you get more applied, you tend to publish more in either trade journals or military journals. So they're not, you know, it's not as common to be in the general scientific literature. For right. Those projects. But we do publish, and if you like to write papers, you can publish as much as you want. Um, I like to do the science and let somebody else publish for me. So. Right, right. So for students who may not be familiar with um, capturing different kinds of gases as sustainable energy sources, can you explain mm -hmm. sort of how that would work in the field and why that's important when you're mm -hmm. explaining? I'll go back in your slides too to show that. Okay. Right. So we generate gases during, you know, during the wastewater treatment. Um, methane is, actually, is natural gas. So it's a common fuel already. There are several things, several generators or other energy generation methods using the methane. Um, hydrogen is a little more complex because, you know, well, hydrogen can be burned, but there's not a lot of commercial off-the-shelf technology ready that will integrate with other systems on an installation. But fuel cells are coming up and hydrogen fuel cells, um, if we can get a way to partner with them, are gonna be a good, Good combination there. Mm -hmm. um, in especially in the army and military, you don't want to create fuels, whether they're gas fuels or liquid fuels, that are foreign to operations, because they don't want to generate a whole new set of generators or a whole new set of you know furnaces. They want to know they want to use stuff that they know and have used before. So mm -hmm. we're really looking in this process that the fuels we are generating are common 
you know, natural gas and hydrogen gas. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Priya asks, by what year do you expect the energy saving paint coatings to be developed or available, guessing to the wider market? And could mm -hmm. the paint coatings be applied to windows? Um, there are some groups that are looking for windows. Uh, right now, the paints we're working on are latex, so they're opaque uh, coatings, and so meant for going on walls and such. Uh, some groups are looking at coatings. Can they actually paint windows with a sort of photovoltaic or conductive um, media that will capture the energy but still let the window operate as a window? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of timeline, I have a feeling because you know we're start starting an applied project and I have a feeling we're gonna have to go back through a basic science to figure out how to make these thermochromes a little more stable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd say optimistically, maybe 10 years. Um, we'll see if anybody can solve the problem of uh, solar light stability. Because right now the best thing to block solar light is something opaque, which kind of defeats the purpose of you know black and white conversions. Right, right. So our apprentices are mostly in labs. We have a few people who are getting out um, into the field. Um, but for those who aren't, can you explain what a day is like when you're out in the field? You had mentioned that you travel a lot, not just for conferences, but for work. So what does a day outside the lab look like? Oh, it can really vary. Um, for me, most of my travel is doing these classes or going to conferences. So it's mostly a normal day and you just go to work at the installation instead of your office. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people who do more of the environmental, we call them bugs and bunnies folks, they go and you know look at endangered species and things like that, they're going to be out in the field a lot more and during a certain season or even longer points of the day because they may only have two or three days to collect their data that they need for the year. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be putting in longer days actually out in the literal field of grass and everything. So it can, it can vary widely. Right, right. Um, so I have a question for both of you, actually. Um, and that is, do you work with interdisciplinary teams? I mean, you're both very focused um, in, in the expertise that you hold, but how do interdisciplinary teams play into um, what you do and your, and your work? I guess I can start, um, but for me, it's very important. Um, a lot of what we do crosses boundaries between science and engineering, and we have some people on our team who are what are referred to as project managers. So they're the people that try to keep our budget in line and actually work with the sponsor. Uh, so having people with a wide variety of skill sets is very important. And one thing I've learned on the job is that you have to be flexible a lot of times, I, you know, I'm a chemist by training, but I've done all sorts of jobs. Just you get that basic foundational skill from going to college and you end up using that in different roles. And so even though you may have different titles, you can work on the same project because you're, you're trying to solve the same problem with your different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Great. And Dr. Berta? Yeah, I would say basically the same thing. Uh, we, you know, I, my lab does day-to-day -day, mostly organic chemistry but we work with uh, chemical engineers we work with um, polymer physicists and, um, and material scientists a lot so you know the, the more complex the problem you're trying to solve the more impossible it becomes for one person to have that level of expertise so you you need to work with the the best people you could find um, for every little aspect of your project i think if, it, if it's going to work um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's just the way, the way science is moving. It's becoming uh, very much uh, in an interdisciplinary game. So you have to be able to do that and you have to be able to communicate with, uh, you know, with the other people. So, you know, that's why you end up taking these courses in, in high school and college that you, it doesn't really seem like they're what you're interested in. They help you communicate with all these different people. So, uh, you know, it's not just lip service. That stuff's really important. Right, right. Um, a couple more questions from Trinity. Was there any piece of advice that helped get you to where you are today? 
If not advice, perhaps a person or motivation. That'll be for both of you. Um, Dr. God, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think my best piece of advice is just keep trying new things. Uh, when I started college, I knew I wanted to do chemistry, but I was planning, I was like, what type of chemistry do I want to do or what type of, you know, do I want a second major? And I sort of had figured some of that out by attending camps over the summer as a high school student. But really my freshman year of college was just taking some of, some of the elective courses you have to take, but using them to sort of narrow down what I would like to do in the future. Um, and just a lot of times you may like things that are, you know, you know in the classroom and the book learning, but when you actually do them, they're not nearly as exciting or vice versa, where you really dread going to a certain class, you struggle with it, but when you see it in practice, see it in the lab, see it actually happening, it's a lot more exciting and you understand it a lot better. So I always recommend just get as many experiences in as you can and don't narrow your choices down too far, too soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you pretty much nailed it, right? There's this, there's this saying that the, um, the master has failed more than the beginner has ever tried. So you always just have to keep pushing, uh, trying new things. Don't be afraid to fail. You're going to fail. If you didn't fail, you didn't try enough. You know, um, there's, there's no harm in failing because you don't even really fail. There's, there's like success and then there's learning. You didn't fail. You learned something from it. Um, and then the other thing is like, take a good hard look in the mirror every day, you know, if you are working as hard as you possibly can. Every second of your day, you know if you're doing something that matters, you know? So find yourself where you're, you know, flipping through your phone, checking your newsfeed and say, okay, I'm done with this now and go do something productive. Uh, it's hard, but that's, you know, and at the end of the day, ask yourself, did I work as hard as I possibly could today? If the answer is yes, then it was an awesome day. If the answer is no, try harder tomorrow, that's it. That's great. That's great. Actually, it um, leads to another question that Rhea asked, um, and I'll ask both of you, is finding a balance between life and work. You know, that age-old question that any, everybody in every field um, and every student uh, needs to find. Yeah, I guess definitely that was one thing I struggled with, especially once I started working here, is I wanted to do everything. So I wanted to go to every conference I could and do everything. I ended up traveling to conferences two or three times a month, which is just got very tiring. Um, and sort of once we started doing the installation energy audits, set up the travel so I was gone no more than a week out of them each month. And that worked a lot better. Um, and you just have to learn to set boundaries for yourself. You know, sometimes there'll be times where you have to work longer days. but a lot of times, you know, if you actually ask yourself, you know, the work will be there tomorrow. And so, you know, go home, you know, relax a little bit, do stuff you enjoy and, you know, keep, find that balance for yourself a lot of times and don't let one side dominate or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the hardest, that's one of the hardest things, uh, especially when you're, when you're starting out to figure out. And uh, somebody told me uh, when I started at UNH, you know, you can, uh, if you can't, if you can't do this job in, um, in 60 hours, you're not going to be able to do it in 80. And if you can do it in 60, you can probably do it in 50. So, you know, don't push yourself to the point of exhaustion. You know, there's a, there's a limit to how much productivity you get out of a work day. Um, after the number of hours you're working sort of reaches a maximum. For me, it's usually like eight to 10. If, I, if I'm working eight to 10 hours in a day, that's the max. I, I, you know, I know people that are like, oh, I can work 16 hours a day, four days a week, and I'm fine. Yeah, I don't know how you do it. That's unbelievable. Um, and, and the other thing is to just you know, keep sort of a mental track of your time. There are 168 hours in the week. You know, you're gonna be asleep 60 of them, fill the rest with stuff that you want to be doing. And if it's not fun anymore, then don't do it. Take a break and move on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, like she said, the, the work is going to be there tomorrow. 
It's always going to be there. Um, you know, if there's something that's not going to be there tomorrow, then maybe you want to prioritize that today. That's the way to the way to do it. Take one day at a time too. Don't don't get too stressed out. Right. I tell my students, it's just bubbles. You're in the lab making bubbles. Really, it's hard to get stressed out about bubbles. So. <laughs> well, that that actually brings me to a question because both of you have been mentors um, to students in the apprenticeship programs. Um, Dr. Guy has worked with CAP, and you also mentioned GEMS, which is Gains in Education, Math, and Science, which is for middle schoolers, and that's supported through um, the AEOP programs. Um, and Dr. Berta, you've been involved with the HSAP, URAP, and REAP programs. So you're talking today to many students, dozens of students who are currently in their apprenticeship programs. So what advice would you have for them about the experience that they are some are in their first or second week? I would say ask a lot of questions. Um, constantly, almost annoyingly so. You can never ask too many questions. Um, you know, people say there's no such thing as a stupid question. There are, there are definitely stupid questions, but you should ask the stupid questions anyway. Um, and uh, enjoy the experience. Um, talk to people. Science is people. That's the most important lesson you can learn. It's not necessarily all about what's happening in the lab. It's about the connections you're making and, and interfacing with a lot of different people. Um, and you know, the fact that you guys are already young uh, college students and high school students already involved in these opportunities, you're light years away uh, ahead of where I was uh, at, at that stage in time. Um, and I still ended up with a decently successful career. So I think you guys have a really bright future. Keep, just keep doing what you're doing and uh, make the most of, of, of the situation. That's great. Dr. Guy? Yeah. A lot, mine's, my advice is very similar. Um, you know, ask questions to your mentor, but also talk to everybody around you. Uh, I really encourage a lot of my students to eat lunch at the cafeteria you know, with the other students, see what their projects they're working on, talk to some of the other uh, researchers around here, you know, go see some of the other projects that are going on. Because if you just stay with your mentor, you're only getting one picture. But there's so much more that happens at a lab or a university than just what your mentor does. So get out there and talk to others and, you know, don't be afraid to ask one of the other apprentices if there are some more, more at your site than just you um, to see what they're doing, to go into their lab for a little bit. Great. I don't think we could end on any better note than that. So thank you both for joining us. Um, looks like we're at the end of our questions from students. So I just wanted to wrap it up quickly um, to let everybody who's on the call know to watch their um, email because we will send out links to more, um, more resources where you can find out more about the AEOP programs, but also DOD STEM programs. So um, things that are funded by the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Um, we'll also post this webinar to our YouTube channel, the first session that um, we ran last week is already on the YouTube channel, so watch your email for that. We'll also be posting it on the social media accounts for the Army Educational Outreach Program and the Academy of Applied Science. So many, many ways for you to find all of these resources. Coming up in July, we've got two, um, two more webinars, um, July 12th and July 25th, and we're thrilled to announce that we are going to have one in the first week of August. So even if your apprenticeship has ended, you are welcome to participate in any of these. These are all for you um, and resources for you to take advantage of now and in the future. So please join us, please join us. And please stay in touch. Um, I know you got an email today saying, feel free to share your story with us. You can tag us with the hashtag AEOP Apprentice um, and certainly tag the AEOP social media accounts or simply email. We'd love to hear from you that way. And um, just to um, finish up with recapping the advice that you just got from Dr. Guy and Dr. Berta is to really take this opportunity with your apprenticeship to step out, to be brave. You've already taken the brave step of 
um, applying and um, getting this position that you have and please take full advantage of it. Everybody you meet, um, wherever you are for your apprenticeship is rooting for you and wants to answer questions, wants to um, tell you about their work and how you can continue um, in the field that you're in or find something else that you're passionate about. So thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Dr. Guy and Dr. Berta. We loved having you today and to everyone who joined the call. And with that, we'll end it and see you on July 12th. Thanks. Thanks.